हेलो गुड इवनिंग जितेंद्र जी गुड मॉर्निंग सर जितेंद्र जी नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग सर वी हैव रिसीव्ड वेरी हेवी वी हैव रिसीव्ड वेरी हेवी रेन हियर ओके हेंस लॉट ऑफ दिस इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम्स ओके हाँ सर वी आर वी आर ट्राइंग अवर लेवल बेस्ट टू करेक्ट बोल रहे नहीं नहीं बोलना नहीं चाहता फटो आया नहीं बस हेलो नमस्ते 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 की खूब याद आ रही है आपको देखते ही हेलो जितेंद्र जी आप अनम्यूट कीजिए आपका म्यूट हो गया है अनम्यूट कीजिए प्लीज अनम्यूट यूर दिस वन अनम्यूट अनम्यूट कीजिए सर ऑल म्यूटेड है कितने हाँ इट इज ओके सर आर यू हियरिंग मी सर यस गुड मॉर्निंग जिटली सर सॉरी गुड इवनिंग जिटली सर हाँ जीवन खटा हुआ नमस्ते 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 Am I unmuted now? Yeah, yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, sir. Thank you. <laughs> There's some problem here also. Ah, uh, it is okay now. Is this still okay? Ah, uh, sir. Ah, uh, do you hear me now? Yeah, I hear. Okay. Uh, we are all hearing you, sir. Let us wait for another two minutes, sir. Wonderful. Yes. and uh, you know i am going to wait, wait for 5 minutes yeah 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 you know join agatta parantu ha abhishek patil inda idu madbeku ne abhishek patil and sri vidya hello avare madta sir namu bar yes sir yes sir We will start the function of six seven five. Six. Six thirty. Another five minutes. We can wait. Okay. हम्म सर और मैं एक्सेप्ट मत करो चलो मैं कोई चीज नहीं सुना नहीं 
ऑलरेडी ये मौत मार देना ही करता है वेरी गुड केले बोलता है ना भाई केले बोलते हैं कि ये पेपर के दारों के हम्म हम्म वेरी गुड चलना भीम कुमार और आगे ले आते can start yeah we can start i think abhishek yes sir yes sir namaste abhishek namaste a good evening and a warm welcome to Yes, uh, she will start, sir. Okay. She, she could start her Namaste, everyone. Good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the second web series organized by Academy of Comparative Philosophy and Religion on the topic, A Scientist's Perspective of Philosophy and Spirituality. It is often said that aim of science is to uncover the deepest spiritual truths and aim of spirituality is the search for the causes behind scientific facts spirituality and science are seeking the same answers to the same question but in a very different ways today is one such occasion to be exposed to this phenomenal correlation by a distinguished guest it is a privilege to have with us today dr bhupendra sharma a neuroscientist from united states of america who is our keynote speaker today we welcome you sir I also welcome Mr. Yambir Jhirli, who is the Secretary of Comparative Philosophy and Religion, and all the secret, all the trustees of the ACPR, and all the participants who are having joined the series. Now I call upon Vijay Lakshmi to give uh, to speak few words on the academy. A uh, very good evening, one and all. This is Vijay Lakshmi uh, speaking from Bangalore currently. so here i am uh, about to uh, say few words about the acpr uh, there are around 33 past participants here and i hope that everyone has come uh, across uh, acpr in one or the other way but uh, still to introduce it uh, it was for, uh, the prospect of prospectus of acpr was prepared by dr r d ranade in 19, 1924 to testify his vision and implementative uh, concern okay and then in 1952 uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, sir c a patwardhan the raja saheb of sangli dr gurudev ranade registered a trust as an academy of comparative philosophy and religion at belgaum okay and then uh, this uh, the academy acpr is uh, situated in hindwadi belgaum and in 1964 the cornerstone of uh, present acpr building, building was uh, laid by dr shri b d jatti and then finance minister of karnataka later on december 8 in 1965 dr s radhakrishnan the president of india then inaugurated the present uh, acpr building at belgaum 
right now uh, acpr is involved in many of the activities uh, related to uh, philosophical publications uh, every year uh, it is publishing like lot of uh, philosophical books and uh, we have got a beautiful library where uh, you, the students who are preparing for ups uh, are coming and sitting and then you know like uh, uh, especially from the poor background so uh, this is the uh, short introduction of uh, acpr now i hand it over to uh, shri vidya chini thank you ms vijayalakshmi it is absolute privilege and honor it is my absolute privilege and honor to introduce the introduce our speaker dr jitendra sharma a neuroscientist from usa i would give a brief introduction of our speaker dr jitendra sharma he took the holy name at the feet of shri gurudev ranade at nimbar in the year 1972 he grew up under the privileged care of professor v s date and shrimati Ma- Mahi Bhai B. Dhatke, who were ardent disciples of Shri Gurudev, Dr. R. D. Ranade. Dr. Jitendra Sharma's father, M. L. Sharma, was student of Prof. Dhatke and di- direct disciple of Gurudev, Dr. R. D. Ranade. His father retired as professor and head of Department of Philosophy at Jodhpur University. Dr. Jitendra Sharma is a neuroscientist by profession. He has received his PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and All India Institute of Medical Science. After a short stint as a joint director in Department of Electronics, Government of India, he decided to take a plunge in research to fulfill his quest to understand inner workings of the brain. So, therefore, in 1994, Dr. Jitendra Sharma went to USA as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Institute of Technology, Cambridge. Dr. Jitendra Sharma thinks of mental disorder as form of brain circuit dysfunction. His recent work is devoted to understanding causes of neurodevelopmental disorders and psychiatric conditions such as autism, schizophrenia, and depression. Currently, he is a group leader and principal investigator at Stanley Center. for psychiatric research at broad institute with joint faculty app- uh, appointments of general hospital harvard medical school and also an investigator at massachusetts institute of technology he leads large international teams of scientists who la- who recently showed how genetic disruptions or mutation causes malformation of brain circuits and influences behaviors of children with autism he is working towards development of the- uh, the- uh, therapies that can uh, that can elevate and treat mental disorder sir this is our honor to listen from you your perspective about the philosophy and religion therefore uh, sir now i hand it over to you to take the function forward sir thank you thank you shri vidya i am really happy to be here and good evening um, good morning for those people who are on this side of the world um it's an honor to be speaking at this uh, wonderful occasion and i must thank acpr especially mr jirli um, to somehow exhort me to to give a talk which i generally don't because um, i'm i don't speak about philosophy so much i'm a scientist i'm happy speaking about my science but uh, this is a, a totally different sort of forum and i'll try to do my best so i decided to do a slight presentation because it helps me to to focus myself and also i think it will be engaging for everybody who's looking at the talk so let me share my screen do you see my screen hello sir are you able to hear or see my screen no sir no Yes. So we can see you, but we cannot. No, sir. Cut that. I 
ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ಹಾಂ ನಮ್ದು ಯಾಕೋ ಇಂಟರ್ನೆಟ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಸೇರ್ ಏನೋ ಓಕೆ ಮಾಡು ಓಕೆ ಹಾಂ ಬೋಟ್ ಕಡೆ but i think you should give him permission to share i guess no there is no permission required because just now i started sharing my screen which is without any permission yeah yeah so can uh, everybody see my screen yes, yes yes okay so i'll just try to show sir how to share the screen so in the chrome browser if you see there is a button here that shows that there is a you know box and there is a up arrow Uh, sir, can you see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, we can see this. Yes. Jeetan, you are on mute. See, we have... Now we can uh, see your screen, sir. We can see your screen, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry for that. Um, let me now start my presentation. Uh... here you go do you see it now yeah hello ha sir okay. um okay let me start now thank you um uh, greetings everyone and thank you for your kind introduction um and for inviting me to give this talk and thanks to all of you for taking time to come and see my talk at the outside i must pay my obeisances to shri gurudev ranade and to my spiritual preceptors um who are the art types of shri gurudev for me uh professor vinay hari date and mrs manthi bai bhi date whose abounding love blessings and grace have been the very life breath of my, me and our entire family so with that let me start i am a scientist a new scientist at then um and a spiritual aspirant also which in a nutshell means that i am confronted with two uphill tasks i think some of the most challenging tasks a uh, human being can aspire as shri gurudev said and other sages have also said that uh, uh, search for direct first hand contact with reality is like walking on shurasa dhara which is like uh, walking on the edge of the sword and so on on the other side i'm trying to make sense of how the mass of tissue which is sitting in my little head here is about 3 3 pounds of of tissue which we call brain how does it work and how can i understand the working of this brain and and how it creates mind so obviously these are two most difficult tasks to my mind but instead of being overwhelmed by these i feel blessed because to me every day is exciting because even the thought of making a, even a little progress is is not only really enchanting it is something that i know will uncover the mysteries which everybody is looking for 
and at least on the spiritual side, I'm looking for how how Sri Gurudev has described the spiritual experiences and to what extent I can follow him. At MIT, where I've been there for almost 30 years now and counting, it is said that if it was easy, it is not for us. We try to do solve the unsolvable. So here is my 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 twin task that I'm trying to, to place before you about how I think about philosophy, religion, and divinity, etc. I can say almost for sure that most scientists would would even cringe at saying that they are they believe in God because somehow they think that is not cool and other people will look down upon that. But I'm biased, not because uh, that I'm a blind follower, but because what I've heard, read, and to a very little extent felt makes me believe that I'm on the right path because I follow those who themselves are highly refined and critical thinkers. They would not take something which is uh, not verifiable as a truth. And the path that they've showed me is real because it allows me to test what I see or what I discover and validate it in light of the experiences and, and the words that I've heard from them. Um, so for a scientist, any topic of interest begins with first searching for the relevant information on the topic and especially for by people who are influential, like the top philosophers or scientists. Let us first look at, at these three influential people, Newton, Einstein, and Kant, which almost everybody knows about. Um, they thought of the universe as mysterious. It is unfathomable. It is awe-inspiring. And deduced from their teachings and their, their works, their conception of the quest for God, the invisible maker and the controller of this universe. So many people know about Newton, almost everybody who has um, received any kind of uh, training or, or studied uh, physics would know about Newtonian um, models and Newtonian physics. Um, his was a, a, a model of pure rationality but what is less understood and known is that he, in his world, in his thinking, God played a crucial role. He devoted a large amount of time in the study of theology. In fact, Newton saw the universe as a manifestation of infinite power of God. If you want to read more about it, you can see a, a blog which was recently published by Marcello Gleeser, which is pretty readable. So his science was just a product of his belief and expression uh, of rational mysticism. It was a, a bridge between the human and the divine, what the human being can know, and how does it inform him to understand the inner workings of this universe, which lead to him to God. Um, I came across one small article from him that he wrote. Um, it was a letter that he wrote to a, an Oxford theologian, and where he says that it is an inc inconceivable that inanimate matter should, without the mediation of something else, which is not material, operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact. We know he's talking about gravity. It is that invisible force which perhaps binds everything that has some mass in this entire universe. Every body uh, attracts everything else, but we can't see this force. We can, we can measure it, we can deduce it, we can create equations about it, but we don't see it. So Newton placed God in his cosmos as an essential player. Then this, the second most influential scientist of at least the 20th century uh, was Einstein, whose thoughts on human mind and conception of God are, are also interesting. I show here um, on the top, these are um, the apartment where um, Einstein lived for several years in Bern, um, in the capital city of Switzerland. And this is uh, one of his, his living rooms. 
um, it, it looks, I visited there just to see how a, a great scientist lives and it was no different from what I've seen um, or I live in, in a place like this. So um, it is not the, the place that makes a human being, but I think um, what goes into their head is what makes you what you are. So he said that human mind, no matter how highly trained, cannot grasp the universe. Uh, he thought of universe as marvelously arranged, obeying certain laws, but we understand very little about them. Our limited minds cannot grasp the mysterious force that sways the constellations. He also wrote that I believe in Spinoza's God, which who reveals himself in a lawful harmony of the world, not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and doings of the mankind. So his was more of a a universal kind of a conception of God. But still, he, to some extent, believed in a, a mysterious force or a controller that in his conception was the, the maker or the, or the controller of this universe. So I just want to bring you a quote from Sri Gurudev on his article of, on science and religion. There's a small story related to this, this article. During my IIT days, I regularly went to Nimbal almost three to four times a year. During one of those visits, um, revered Sri Nagpur Karji was there. He was managing the daily worship and meditation program. And I met him several times. He used to love me. And um, when he came to know that I'm an aspiring scientist, he, he gave me an old issue of Satsang, a publication which was uh, done from uh, Nimbal Ashram, and he pointed to an article which which was written by Sri Gurudev. It was um, reprinted there on science and religion. And there he he writes that physical forces, gravitation. You don't see it. We use it. We feel it. We can come up with equations to calculate it and use it to our advantage. But it is invisible. It is all electricity. You can almost see. Uh, in his thoughts, the reflection of Newton and Einstein. Um, later on, somewhere else, he writes that scientific creativity does not emerge from a vacuum, and instead, that, that science has deep ties with the philosophy and religion. So um, that article is 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 in typical Gurudeva's style. It is very simply written, but has very deep insights on the issues that are still relevant and thought provoking even after 50, 60 years of research, as well as um, hopefully um, uh, thinking about the phys philosophy and science. Um, when I read it, uh, which I, I still read it um, multiple times, I can see that um, Sri Gurudev tries to draw parallels between science and religious methods of inquiry and creates a framework which he wants to bring sort of to harmonize scientific thought uh, with philosophy and religion and vice versa, because he thinks that both can benefit for the other. Then the third person who, who was influential thinker was, of course, uh, the great philosopher of the West, Emmanuel Kant. I am not a student of philosophy, so, so I do not read much of his work, but my father used to, to uh, sort of recall one of the, the most famous passages, which is also inscripted on his tombstone in Kilingard in Germany. It says that two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So great scientists and thinkers of the West did accept to a degree that there is an invisible controller of the universe because they were fascinated how even at the level of mighty galaxies and star constellations to small objects and even in, in our mind, something binds us. It creates an order for as long as the universe has existed. It is something which is, which is time tested, which has been there forever and probably will remain forever. So uh, coming back to the philosophy of, of Professor Ranade, 
Uh, Shri Gurudev obviously cared deeply about current developments and discoveries in physics, biology, and neurology, and all other aspects of science. And he even presented them in his lectures and writings. For example, here is an abstract from his presidential address he delivered in the 13th session of the Indian Philosophical Congress in Nagpur in December 1937. He says, recent discoveries in modern physics, biology, neurology, and so forth, and explain how they all tend to prove that spirit is the only reality and how Western thought can be brought into harmony with the conclusions of the great Indian sages and philosophers. Um, in this talk, he, he devotes quite some time on discovery, discoveries of influential physicists and cosmologists, James Jeans, who was very influential in the, in the early half of the, the 20th century. Um, and he quotes that there is one continuous stream of life which runs through the whole universe, which permeates us all. This line of thought, he says, is in harmony with the spiritual idealism preached by philosophers and, and, and uh, saints all over the world. He also refers to a very important experiment by a German biologist. His name was Hans Dreisch. Um, Dreisch did some, some fundamental experiments in late 19th century and early 20th century. I'll just briefly summarize it. Um, we, it is very well known for, for biologists that soon after an egg is fertilized, an embryo is developing in humans as well as all mammals, it starts to differentiate. One cell becomes two cells, two cells become four and eight like this, and it goes on forever. So Dreisch asks, um, what happens if I he, he breaks down uh, two halves of this, the two cell stage of this embryo, which is developing? And he just did that in a small sea element called sea urchin. So he, when the single cell was dividing at the two cell stage, he, he basically uh, broke them asunder and made them into two separate cells. And then he asked whether they will develop normally or they'll die. And what he found was that the two halves of the cells were really developed independently, but normally. They were smaller in size, uh, which he could not explain, but what was important that he found that the machinery for, for existence of these two cells was complete in, in both of these halves, and they could develop independently. They were not necessarily uh, interdependent. So which is one of the fundamental principles of developmental biology, which about which we have we now know about 100 years later, a lot more. Uh, you've heard of <coughs> in vitro fertilization, and the test tube babies and everything. These are all dependent on his insights that he developed in the early part of the, the 20th century. <clears throat> so, in any event, the, the point I want to make is that uh, Shingurde followed scientific discoveries, and to my mind, <clears throat> he used them to refine and rationalize his own thinking on religious beliefs and validation of his own spiritual experiences. So he was one of one of those like very thinking, very um, rational kind of a mystic, um, who who was not afraid of of refining his thinking um, based on the, the current science as it was it was uh, developing at that time, and and try to create a, a harmony between his own spiritual experiences and his thinking in in light of those discoveries, but. I'm a neuroscientist. What about the brain? What do we know? How it works? <clears throat> I told you earlier about Khan that he was fascinated by starry heavens above and moral principle within. In light of modern discoveries of brain and its internal workings, I'd like to add to his epithet that starry heavens above and brain circuits within. So here I show on the top, the top two panels are um, the dense sort of um, picture of galaxy uh, published by NASA. And here on the, on the right side is an up-close view of one of the elements of this, uh, this uh, galaxy. You can see at an instant that how complex it is. And on, on the bottom in these two um, pictures I'm showing you 
the complex nature of the connectivity of the brain. Um, the left side was created by one of my friends who is a colleague at Harvard. His name is Dr. Van Bideen. He uses um, structural MRI to, to trace connections between different uh, cells of the brain and make 3D structures out of that. And this is an actual uh, brain connectivity that he has shown from human brain. And you can see how complex it is. But it is still a very primitive picture of what actual the brain connection is. On the right side is a picture of a, of a research paper that um, a scientist, his name was Bobby Kasuri, uh, when he was um, a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Jeff Lichtman's lab, again in Harvard. He took a very small part of the, of the brain of a mouse, about 200 micron, just to give you an idea. 200 micron is about a hundredth of the speck of a cent. So he took that very, very small tissue of the brain and he tried to recreate uh, using very sophisticated electron microscopy and um, computer algorithms to, to see the connections of every cell with, with every other cell that it was, it was made connections to. And what you see is this, this complex picture. And now think about if you want to do the same thing for the entire brain. Human brain has about 10 billion cells. Um, that is the estimate, uh, which makes about a trillion connections. Um, to, it, it, as, a, as a normal human being, if I think about it, I, I cannot even fathom what, what complexity we, it'll, um, it'll create and how to make sense out of it. But, you know, just this last week, I, I became part of a, of a collaborative, uh, very large collaborative uh, research program in which the National Institute of Health at, um, in USA has funded us to create an entire cell by cell map of the, the human brain. It will be a, um, a multi-year effort by probably thousands of scientists. But at the end of the day, we aspire over 10 years um, to make an atlas, cellular narrow atlas of the entire brain of the human brain. Um, I, it is not that I'm, I, I'm just fortunate to be part of that, um, but it is, it is going to take thousands of scientists to do it. But we feel that at the end of the day, we'll have a better picture of how to understand brain and then, of course, treat mental diseases. Um, I won't bore you with too much of complexities of terminologies of neuroscience, but I just, just to, uh, because I'm a neuroscientist and a lot of things that I think about are, are the connections between different cells of the brain. I just give you a very small snapshot. So on this, on the, on the top right, uh, left, I'm showing you the basic building blocks of the, uh, of the brain circuits. Since I, I trained as an engineer and a physicist, I like to think about brain connections as circuits. So this is a, a term I, some of us who, who have engineering mind have coined. <clears throat> so the, the basic thing is that uh, the, there are specialized cells in the brain, which are called neurons. Uh, neuron is what looks like a, in pink here on the top. I don't know if you see my cursor, but in the print uh, with uh, lots of connections going on the top and uh, on all sides. This is the body of the cell. And these are the connections that it makes with other similar uh, neurons and receives information which it processes and then transmit this information to this yellow sort of pipeline structure to other parts of the, of the brain to other neurons. And this transfer of information occurs through this small sort of um, tiered up like, like structure, which is called synapse. And there's a chemical exchange of this information. Neurochemicals, uh, they, they cross this, this tiered up like structure to the other side, and they carry the information, what this cell has processed and wants to give to the other side. So um, when I was at IIT, um, I, I was working with brain, but I never thought about the fundamental principles of the brain and the brain circuits. My work was totally on different. Sort of, I was trying to understand the, 
uh, raise pressure volume relationship in the diseases. So um, when in 1934, uh, 1994, when I first arrived at MIT, my professor at that time, he asked me if would I, I would like to do a project in which we'll try to rewire the brain. And I was immediately sort of astounded. What brain is not an electrically wired circuit or something that that lights a light bulb or sort of can be used to transfer some some message, electrical messages and all. It is a mass of tissue. How do you say it is it is brain circuit? He said it is indeed the brain circuit. There are multiple circuits there and <clears throat> they connect specific parts of the brain from other parts. I'll just give you a small snapshot. So here is um, two parts of the sensory system. Uh, we know our, our vision starts from, from our eyes, but actually the process of vision of seeing act starts at the back of the brain. Eyes transmit the information that it receives in form of very simple inputs from the outside world. And then there are fibers or connections which course through the, uh, through the brain to the, to the entire brain actually, and go to the back, right at the back of the brain, to, the, to my back, where a specialist area, uh, uh, a circuit, which is called primary visual area, processes for the first time what our eyes are seeing. Um, in the middle of the brain, there's a relay station where the, the, the two eye connections are sifted across and they still remain uh, sort of left eye and right side eye are still uh, giving their own information, which is later integrated into different parts of the brain. There are about 38 areas in the brain which process vision, uh, especially in, in, in human beings and primates. So we are very yeah. visual areas. Um, in the, on the auditory side also, um, the process of hearing starts with the, with the ears. Um, uh, the, the auditory signal or the sound signal is, is uh, converted into electrical impulses, which goes through the, uh, through the middle of the brain from the ears like, like this. And then they go to another specialized area, which is called auditory cortex or the sound processing board. So, what we know about is that there are specialized areas in the brain that process uh, hearing, that process vision, that process our sense of touch, smell, etc. And for the most part, at least at that time, we knew that all of these do not necessarily exchange information. And these are very specialized circuits which can only do things that they are, they are supposed to do. Um, but my professor said that, uh, th thought that these, these um, sort of circuits can be changed. They are not fixed. So the thing at that time was that um, when we are, we are born, we, we are born with a genetic information which, which creates these circuits and which are fixed. They are um, sort of, there's a, there's a, there's a fixed um, imprinted circuit there, which only does what it is supposed to do. And we wanted to see if, if that is true. Um, so how do we do something like this? Um, when our brain develops inside mother's womb for nine months, there's wiring of these brain circuit that starts. It happens um, in a very systematic manner. Each day, each week, and each month, this circuit, the electrical wiring or 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 the circuit wiring is taking place. The electrical impulses are coursing slowly through these new circuits or, or connections which are being made from the eye to the back of the brain where uh, they finally should reach. Um, and this happens in all mammals, like cats, mouse, elephant, tiger, uh, monkeys, human beings. Every animal, every mammal has the same sort of circuit diagram. Um, and depending on how many months this baby is in the womb, that determines how far it has reached. For example, if, if a baby is born for an animal if, uh, about one month, so it, uh, its eye connections or visual connections have only reached about the first month of a human uh, baby's development. 
Uh, this brings me to this interesting animal which on which we did this experiment. It is called ferret. It's a cute little animal which is which looks almost like a mongoose that we see in India. Um, why it is interesting is that when a ferret baby is born, it is about after the first trimester. So in the first trimester, the connections from the eye have reached this, this middle relay station here in the middle of the brain, which means uh, these connections have not reached the final destination, which is at the back of the brain. And my quest was to somehow change these connections and change their course so that they end up somewhere else. And what we decided was uh, to, to put these eye connections into the area that processes hearing or sound. So just to give you the complex case of this problem is that when a ferret is born on the first day of the birth, uh, the brain of this this uh, uh, this little um, teeny tiny animal is about the quarter of the size of my 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 thumbnail. So I practiced a lot. After several months of practicing, I was able to do microsurgery, uh, by which I connect. I basically changed the connections I show on the on the left side of the screen. The connections of the eye that goes to the area that processes sound. There are many, many details. I don't want to bore you with that, but this paper, when we published in 2000 in, uh, in the nature, uh, in the journal Nature, it was a big news because it was for the first time anybody ever showed that brain circuits are so malleable, so, so, so changeable, so def uh, deformable. And the upshot of that was that brain is like a tabula rasa. It is like a blank slate. And you can write what that area, a specific area of the brain can do is by changing the kind of inputs that are going to that area. The visual area is visual because it receives inputs from the eyes. If I make that, those inputs from the eye go to some other area of the brain, that area will start processing the inputs, which are the visual inputs, um, and not the one that it is supposed to do. There are many more details. I it, it's not important here, um, but the idea was that we were able to show that there is a, a constant exchange between nature and nurture. What comes um, genetically imprinted is very malleable, and I can change it. I can modulate it. I can I can make it to to do a totally different function just by changing uh, the inputs it is receiving. Um, let me bring you back to what Sri Gurudev has written um, uh, in some of his works. In, in Pathway to God in Hindi literature, he cites um, a Doha from Kabir and another says, Jo kahe wo sune nahi, sune so dekhe nahi. One who hears does not see, ears don't, uh, that hear do not see, and vice versa. But later on, somewhere else, he, he uh, quotes Kabir by saying, Vani Bhuti Bas, which means, um, fragrant speech. The faculty of speech has acquired olfaction, the sense of smell. He also writes about spiritual experiences um, very eloquently and very precisely um, in, in his lectures on Kannada mysticism. He, he says that mysticism is philosophy of God realization. It implies. And it implies and involves the faculty of intuition. Now he defines intuition That's that it is, it is not sensory perception, it is suprasensorous experience. And it is generated within, it is central. So it is not the, the sensation which is coming from outside. It is, it is something which is generated inside, probably inside our, our brain, uh, which creates this faculty of intuition, which is essential for spiritual experiences, which are suprasensory, which is that they are beyond the sensory, normal sensory experience. He also says that uh, a blind man, uh, uh, a blind man was able to see and a deaf man was able to hear, or 
uh, he quotes Surdas and Andeko Sab Kuch Darshai. Yeah. So, and then he also says that the suprasensual experience is something like uh, catalepsia, what he calls. It is like merging and intertwining of sensory faculties. So, all sensory or suprasensory experience is something which is which is an integration, an internally generated integration of different uh, sensory experiences, uh, which are uh, which are interdependent, which are integrated, and which are transferable. So um, it is fascinating that uh, when he says about this, this suprasensory experience and um, in the in my ex experiments, at least I was able to, to show one faculty of this, which can um, which shows that there is a there is a malleability of sensory experience, but I do not know if this is what he called a suprasensory experience. I don't think it is, but maybe a totally different plane. But it is not inconceivable that one can create uh, circuits in which all sensory systems can, within the brain, can come together and exchange their information. How the brain will process that information, I do not know. But it is possible, at least to an extent, uh, by physical means to change the circuits of the brain uh, where sensory experiences can be interchanged. So in, I, I, I want to sort of go to the final part of my talk in which I want to, uh, to bring in the connection between mind and brain. Uh, recent researchers in neuroscience are developing a lot of time in search for physical basis of mind which means it is dependent on the, the brain and it's working. Um, what is mind? The way we understand about it is that it is some form of internally generated concept uh, which, which creates our feelings, our will, our emotions and all. We do know there are specialized circuits in the brain where emotions are processed. Uh, even with the Rane has also written about some, some of those emotional areas um, uh, but i want to try to make a connection uh, with the faculty of intuition that he's talking about which is the key aspect of understanding what is spatial experience is this faculty of intuition part of the same mind which in some ways is created by the, the physical factors which is the brain the circuits of the brain if not then what, why it is it is not and and how it is different. That is a task that it is unsolvable, at least at this point in time. Um, he, he says that faculty of intuition is centrally generated within me. Um, when I say I'm happy, I like you, I feel good, I feel sad, all these are, are emotions or internal states, internal, um, um, internally generated concepts that actually um, sort of affect how I see this world. If I am sad, the same same scene looks very different from when I say, hey, I'm, I'm flying in the sky, I'm uplifting. Uh, the same scene looks very differently. Uh, but we also know that we can change our internal state by physical means. Um, if I put fine wires in, uh, of electrodes in my brain and I stimulate it with very small um, current I can make you laugh, I can make you cry, I can make you sleep, or I can wake you up. So this, this the neurosurgeons do all the time. There's a, um, there's a, um, a, a surgery which is called deep brain stimulation surgery, which is actually used for, to, to treat um, sort of intractable depression and other um, conditions like ataxia. Uh, we, as scientists, we also do it all the time. So we put small wires in the in the brain and we stimulate. We can actually now do uh, put some some genes that are optically uh, activable, uh, which can enter into the into the cell without destroying the cell. And I can control the cells working by just using laser light of different frequencies. So this is all 
now possible. Um, so, in the current uh, sort of state of brain science, I, I also want to bring uh, your attention to mental disorders. In many mental disorders or internal state changes, which changes our behavior. For example, a lot of my current work is on autism and, and schizophrenia. An autistic child does not play spontaneously with others. It behaves very differently, which is, which is in, in most, most cases very apparent to everybody. He, he makes his own play, he's more introspective, he's less social, he doesn't show that kind of empathy that other children show generally. And uh, we also know that, know that a lot of uh, many types of autism and schizophrenia have their um, uh, have some sort of genetic abnormalities here. There are specific genes when they are uh, misplaced or, or uh, like so genes are basically we are, our, our life code is the DNA. The letters of the of the DNA make our life code, and if some parts of that that are misspelled or misplaced or miswired. Um, uh, it, it creates a different kind of a, a situation in the brain, uh, which makes us think very differently or react to ordinary situations very differently, like an autistic child does. Uh, so me, me and my group, we have identified a gene, uh, which if it is missing in our DNA, will give uh, create a form of autism. And if I shift it a little bit, it creates another kind of disorder, which is called obsessive compulsive disorder. And if I if I uh, replace it a little bit more, the same gene in a totally different uh, part of the of the DNA, then it creates schizophrenia. So the same gene, if it is misplaced or deleted or uh, or 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 expanded, it creates different circuits in the brain which makes um, the person who has this abnormality behave very differently. Um, so we did first did this experiment uh, to create a parallel situation in mice. So we, we deleted this gene. And when these mice were uh, become a little older, because of this gene and this de gene de abnormality, uh, these mice have uh, what is called an uh, obsessive compulsive like disorder. They, they keep scratching themselves continuously to the extent that they start to um, create ulcers on their, on their skin. And then what we do is we, we reintroduce this. Now we have the ability to reintroduce the, the gene that we had taken out. And then we see that these mice become very normal. They become very social. They stop scratching themselves and their wounds also start to heal. The same thing can be done in genetically engineered monkeys uh, because it is easier to see genetically engineered monkeys behavior which is much closer to, uh, to the human behavior to try to understand to what extent this gene is creating mental uh, functional disorders. For example, um, monkeys which are born with this um, gene abnormality, they lick their fingers like some of the autistic children do. They are also very fearful for other monkeys in, in their cages. Uh, they don't look directly into the eyes or faces of monkeys and human beings, the researchers. And then uh, we now have an ability um, to reintroduce a gene in the genetic code of this monkey, which is born with this uh, genetic abnormality. And these monkeys, um, after some time, become normal. They start behaving normally. They do what monkeys do. So uh, that means that uh, by changing the genes, we can change the brain and its, uh, its circuits, which gives rise to the internal states, at least to an extent, the internal states, uh, which also changes their behavior. Which brings to this this uh, me to this difficult uh, sort of uh, situation where. Um, I know that at least a part of my mind I can change by changing the brain circuits, which, is, which can be done physically. But probably there's another plane of, of mind 
which is not physical, which Professor Rane talks about, which creates this faculty of intuition or which allows us to have a, a sort of a dialogue or a conversation with the spirit. And we do not know what it is. Um, but there's still a lot of research to be done to make some sense out of it. Um, I also want to, to bring to your attention some of the, the characteristics of spiritual experience because they also have something to do with uh, the brain and brain processes to, to an extent and, um, and to the mind. So, uh, Gurudev well, says that um, spiritual exp experience is not merely intuition. It, intuition is only a start of it. It is evolutionary. Okay. It is attended by a process of growth. It is continuously growing. If it is not continuous, if it comes and goes, it is not a spiritual experience. He writes with categorically. So the continuity and the process of growth okay. is what he calls as asymptotic approximation to reality. So a saint um, nudges as he progresses in his spiritual path, uh, nudges closer and ever closer to reality, but never meets reality. He is never one with reality. He is very close to it, depending on where he is in his spiritual progress. Uh, but he also says that mystical experiences are valid because they are universal, they are objective, and they are necessary. These are loaded words, which I don't have time to go into. I have my own conception of this, but uh, uh, the final part is that spatial experience also brings in the uh, feeling of beatification, some sort of an enjoyment or fulfillment. Is this enjoyment similar to the enjoyment that we see in our mind when I stimulate a part of the brain, which makes me feel euphorious? Is this enjoyment same or it is different? It is something uh, only future can tell. Um, and uh, so it brings me back to the questions I started from. As a neuroscientist, I have this still this unsolved task of understanding how the brain works and what is mind, how it is created. And for a spiritual aspirant within me, what is uh, I want to understand more about what is faculty of intuition, how it is different from the mind that I can change by physical means. Uh, by changing brain circuits or genes and of course what constitutes suprasensuous experience supramental condition to what extent it is dependent on brain and genes is something which i'm, I'm still sort of uh, discovering so this brings me back to the full circle where i started from that i'm still on a pathway to understand the most complex of two problems trying to find uh, what is spiritual experience and how do I experience it and how brain works. Uh, so I end here. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I personally thank you because I'm now a professional. Science I studied only in school. And, it, and the blend philosophy and spirituality with that of a science and the Saints are really scientists because without even studying about the science, whatever they told is proved to be scientific, is what your your self just now told. I sincerely thank you, sir, and it's really an honor for all of us to hear from you. Now I call upon uh, Mr. Abhishek Patil, who is also a lawyer from Bangalore, uh, to render vote of Abhishek, you're muted. Sorry, sir. Thank you, Sri Vidya. Uh, a warm good evening to one and all present here. And a stormy good evening to one and all present in Belagami. I heard it is pouring there. It is an absolute privilege and honor for me to thank on behalf of everyone, the guest of today's event, as well as the people who are responsible for setting up this platform where we are witnessing thought-provoking ideas being exposed. I would like to thank the guest of today's event and the speaker, Dr. Chichendra Sharma, Guru scientist, for giving his valuable time to us. Because uh, initially, uh, when we came to know about this topic, we were all fascinated by it because the topic itself was captivating. Because for us, it is a general myth that spirituality and science are poles apart. But today, after your uh, lecture, I can speak on behalf of everyone that we are all fascinated by 
the thoughts which you shared with us and we would like to discover more about it about the phenomenal correlation ship between science spirituality and philosophy including concepts of intuition and the relationship between brain and mind therefore i would like to sincerely thank dr sharma for having introduced to us these phenomenal concepts and their correlation ship secondly i would like to thank shri mb jerli secretary of acpr because these webinars are his brain child i would like to thank him for bridging this gap between intellectuals and common people like us and lastly i would also like to thank everyone who is who are associated with acpr vijay lakshmi bhim sen and shri vidya and everyone else and also the audience for making this event successful thank you thank you one and all thank you one more jai shri gurudev thank you shri gurudev jai shri gurudev thank you जय श्री गुरु जय श्री गुरु जय श्री गुरु जितेंद्र जी वेरी नाइस टू हियर यू फ्रॉम द हेड क्वार्टर ऑफ एकेडमी ऑफ कंपेरेटिव फिलोसॉफी एंड रिलीजन थैंक यू वेरी मच जय गुरुदेव थैंक यू सर थैंक यू जय श्री गुरुदेव Good. Thanks. Good. Hmm. And if there are difficulty, if you know, you can make correct that. Hmm. Arvat, Arvat, I didn't participate, my brother. Answer. One hour. Seven, seven minutes. Oh my God. Our participants are just taking a minute. Call and answer. Recording. 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 Recording.